Hello everyone, this is Jake Five from Five Pin Roll. We're here in, or I'm here actually, in Matewan, West Virginia. Now what's interesting about this place and this exact street, how you doing? This is the exact street, about the same view they would have seen. The tracks we were told have been elevated a little bit, but these tracks were here. These buildings were here during the massacre and all that stuff. And if you pan real quickly, that building over there was Sid Hatfield's office in jail. Sid Hatfield was the chief of police here in Maywan at the time. And during the strikes, the mine wars of 1919 through 1921, he says he was neutral, but there's evidence that possibly suggests otherwise and things like that. On May 19, 1920, 10 men were killed in a gunfight in the small town of Matewan, West Virginia that would become known as the Matewan Massacre. This year is the 100 year anniversary of the massacre, and in this video we are going to take a look at this bloody event in history that has been largely forgotten. In 1912, the Paint Creek Cabin Creek strike erupted when miners demanded better pay, better work conditions, the right to trade where they pleased, which ended the practice of forcing miners to buy from company-owned stores, and recognition of the United Mine Workers of America, known as the UMWA. The mine owners refused to give the miners what they wanted, and they hired the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency as mine guards and strike breakers to put an end to the strike. The Baldwin Feltz had a reputation for being ruthless, bloodthirsty, and relentless in their pursuit of getting the job done. As soon as the detectives arrived, there were hostilities between them and the miners. On September 1, 1912, approximately 6,000 unionized miners from across the Kanawha River crossed the river and declared their intent to kill the mine guards and destroy the company operations. Due to this threat, the mining companies deployed additional armed guards and awaited the attack. Consequently, the governor proclaimed martial law to be in effect on September 2, 1912. After many deaths, the strike ended in 1913, with the miners accepting a deal that benefited the mine owners more than the miners. Even though they were back in the mines, there was still a spark of rebellion burning in the mines across West Virginia. In April 1920, between 275 and 300 miners in Matewan, located in Mingo County, joined the UMWA in a retaliation the Burnwell Coal and Coke Company fired all union-aligned miners and gave them three days to leave their company-owned houses. On April 27, 1920, Mingo County officials arrested Baldwin Feltz agent Albert C. Feltz for illegally evicting miners of the Burnwell Coal and Coke Company as punishment for union activity. Mingo County Sheriff G. T. Blankenship negotiated with miners groups that as long as only Mingo County officials enforced the eviction notices, the miners would peacefully comply. A miners tent colony was set up outside Matewan for evicted miners, and there would be killings in and around Mingo County throughout the weeks leading up to the massacre. About 3,000 miners had joined the UMWA and armed themselves for all-out war against the mine owners. One of the main mine companies in the area, the Stone Mountain Coal Company, hired the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency to once again put down the strike. This led to many attacks on mines and storage facilities were blown up. Replacement workers were kidnapped and executed, and the Baldwin Feltz retaliated by creating false charges against UMWA members and then murdering them in the woods and along the roads. This enraged the miners who increased their attacks, but they were soon to have a hero to lead them all, a man by the name of Sid Hatfield. Sid Hatfield had a reputation for hard living and fighting, and his appointment in 1919 to the post of Police Chief of Matewan by the Mayor, Cabell Testerman, surprised some of the more respectable people in town. Both Hatfield and Testerman were proud supporters of the UMWA, and they aided the miners in any way that they could. Sid Hatfield had been a miner when he was younger, and some say he was at Paint Creek during the strike of 1912. When fighting broke out in 1920, it is said that he and his deputy, Ed Chambers, had led an attack on the coal tipple in Mohawk, West Virginia that led to the deaths of many mine guards. Hatfield did not like the Baldwin Feltz, and they attempted to bribe him into giving them information about the UMWA, and he allegedly laughed them out of the county. On May 19th, a number of Baldwin Feltz detectives, led by Albert Feltz and Lee Feltz, were sent to evict families living at the Stone Mountain Coal Camp just outside Matewan. The plan was for the detectives to make the evictions and then catch train number 16 back to Bluefield where their headquarters were. The sheriff and his deputy of the coal camp sensed trouble and met the Baldwin Feltz detectives at the train station. 
News of the eviction soon spread around the town, and there was a large number of miners in town that day because a shipment of supplies and money had just arrived from the UMWA. Sid Hatfield then called Tony Webb, who was a deputy sheriff of Mingo County and was a friend of the UMWA, and requested him to send up warrants for the arrest of Feltz and his men. Webb told Hatfield that he could not get the warrants to mate one before train number 16 would run. This led Sid to remark over the phone, Fine, we will kill them before they leave the town. The miners then set up an ambush along the road that the detectives would be walking down. While these men were at the railroad near the station preparing to take the train, Sid Hatfield and a group of men came up to Mr. Feltz and questioned him about what they were doing in town. Sid then told him that he would have to hold the detectives until after number 16 ran. When Sid Hatfield approached Mr. Feltz, Mr. Feltz served a warrant for Sid Hatfield, but Hatfield seemed to not care about the warrant and believed it was a fake. Once they reached Chambers Hardware Store, Sid went inside while Mr. Feltz stood outside in front of the door. Some questioned the genuineness of the warrant, and at the time Mr. Feltz was surrounded by a large crowd of men. Mayor Cabell Testerman walked up and Mr. Feltz passed the warrant over to him for examination. There was an argument between the three men, and no one knows who fired the first shot, but after the first shots were fired, Albert Feltz was dead, and Mayor Testerman was lying on the ground with a mortal wound. Some say Sid Hatfield stuck his revolver up within a few inches of Albert Feltz's head and shot him while Feltz was arguing with Testerman. Before the detectives could draw their weapons, the miners opened fire from all sides, and Sid Hatfield shot Lee Feltz and C.B. Cunningham, a key member of the detectives' ranks. The detectives scattered and tried to flee, but they were hunted down and shot by the miners. A few managed to escape and make it back to Bluefield. After the shooting had stopped, Sid Hatfield fired a shot into the body of Albert Feltz, and another miner walked up and fired a high-powered rifle into the head of Albert Feltz. It's estimated a few hundred shots were fired, and after the smoke had cleared, Mayor Testerman laid in the street, dying. Seven detectives were dead, and three miners also lay dead. Mayor Testerman was aided by his wife, but he ended up dying in the streets from his wounds. Sid Hatfield boasted around town that he had killed the head detectives, and he dared more Baldwin Fells to challenge him. This challenge would prove fatal. Sid Hatfield was held as a hero, and the UMWA used the victory as a major propaganda campaign to get more miners on their side. They even sent a small film crew to film Sid in a short film called Smiling Sid, and the miners' ranks swelled to over 5,000. Governor John Cornwell ordered the state police force to take control of Maywan. Hatfield and his men cooperated and stacked their arms inside the hardware store. On July 1st, the miners' union went on another strike, and widespread violence erupted. Railroad cars were blown up, and strikers were beaten and left to die on the side of the road. Tom Feltz, the last remaining Feltz brother, sent undercover operatives to collect evidence to convict Sid Hatfield and his men. Tom Feltz wanted revenge, and the only thing that could satisfy him and the agency was the death of Sid Hatfield. Sid Hatfield and his deputy Ed Chambers were brought up on charges of destroying the Mohawk mining camp in McDowell County. On August 1st, 1921, Hatfield, Chambers, and their wives traveled unarmed to the McDowell County Courthouse in Welch to stand trial. Upon reaching the courthouse, Hatfield and Chambers were shot and killed by waiting Baldwin Feltz agents. In the coming weeks, between 5,000 and 20,000 miners marched on Charleston, the capital of West Virginia, to have their plight heard, and after being denied, they decided to march on Logan, where Sheriff Don Chafin had assembled a private army to destroy the miners. This culminated in the Battle of Blair Mountain, and during the battle, U.S. Army troops were called in to put down the miners, and the U.S. Air Force even dropped chemical and regular bombs on the miners' position and in the towns, and it's the only time the U.S. military took up arms against a striking force. After the battle ended, the U.S. Army took control and forced an end to the mine wars, and the government sided with the mine owners, much to the surprise of the miners. Several striking miners were arrested for treason, but most were sent home unemployed. UMWA membership dropped significantly between 1921 and 1924. It's impossible to figure out how many people died in the mine wars, but some people estimate the number was over 1,500. This is easily one of the darkest chapters in American history, and it's been purposely forgotten. But the spirit of the miner still lives on in the hills of southern West Virginia.
that building right there is the old jail and police office and that's where Sid Hatfield um, pretty much ran this town. He was the chief of police here at Mate One and that is also where if you remember the Hatfield McCoy feud that's where uh, Devil Ants Hatfield's brother he died in this building. That's where it happened. 